my biggest fear are my doubts. And I say constantly to my doubt, leave me, come on, go away. Hi guys, this is Wei and Eleanor. We are here just to meet with the Beaver family. Well, you know, guys, this has got to be one of the most hotly contested launches of all time. It is the legend Jean-Claude Beaver in his, what he calls the final stage of his career, and his son Pierre Beaver, and they have gotten together to create a brand which is meant to showcase the very best of high finishing and complications. So guys, join us, please. What's going on guys, Waco from Revolution and here at the most hotly anticipated launch of 2023, it is the eponymous brand of a legend of the watch industry, Jean-Claude Biver. So let's meet with him. Mr. Biver, how are you? I'm fine, I'm excited. Hi guys, this is Elena from Revolution. I am here with a legend in the making. His name is Pierre Biver and he's the son of a person that needs no introduction anymore. How are you today? Hello, I'm very good and you? Thank you for the good. kind words. Very nice <laughs> very introduction. Welcome. I hope I can live up to, to your words. You know, uh, the first question I want to ask you about is about the word love. In the brands that you worked with before, you use love as a communication message. But, but love in this enterprise is very different because it's the love between you and your son. <laughs> oh yes, I didn't think about it. It's, it's, it's totally different. But uh, love is one of my main principle of my own religion. You know, either you follow a religion or you have to make your own religion. And I made my own religion and the religion is called, like the Beatles said in June 1967, all you need is love. And I said, I have to take love as a global concept. What does it mean? It means I have to share. Sharing is love. I have to respect. Respecting is love. I have to forgive. Forgiving is love. If I have these three elements in my life as my own attitude, my ethics, then I have replaced the religion by my own religion. So that is how important the name love is for me. Now for my brand, I have double love. I have the love because passion is, a, is also a, a, an expression of love. I have the passion of my brand and I have the love of my son and the two are in one. And that's just privilege. I am the, the most privileged man to have the two in one. First of all, it's an incredible journey to, to do something like that with your father. Uh, I'm super thankful and to have this opportunity and to live uh, through this experience. Uh, I mean, it's, it's so incredible to have a father like my father. Uh, he's always been so supportive uh, for me and for my brothers and sisters that we should find our passion, we, we should do what we love. We really grew up with parents that told us to be curious, to, to discover the world, to be able to find what, what really motivates us in life. I had the chance and at the same time it's maybe a a curse, but to be passionate about watchmaking and to see his reaction to my passion for watchmaking was incredible and it's a huge sign of love and you know I couldn't be more fulfilled than him sometimes listening to me, respecting my opinions. It's not always easy and that barrier of father and son sometimes creates the most uh, the most intense intimate moments and at the same time the most intense uh, aggressive moments as well because we have no filters. Um, but yeah, but I think it even experience. goes further than just a relationship between a father and his son, which is usually kind of um, complicated and harsh, but also full of love. But this time we're talking about your father, who's a legend. So you're adding an additional component, which is not a small one, uh, to the equation. How do you cope and how do you handle having a father like yours, especially in that industry? Uh, I think it gives a sense of responsibility because obviously being so proud of, of what my father has been able to accomplish, there's this pressure of not, before having the pressure of saying, I want to do a career myself, there's the pressure of saying, I don't want to impact in any harmful way my father's career, I want to preserve it. So um, it, it humbles you, it, it makes you want to do great things, to always double check, it gives you a lot of doubts, which my father appreciates a lot that I doubt. 
me a bit less. So I asked you about love. Now I want to ask you about another word, uh, and the word is fear. Because, you know, the last time we spoke, you said your mastery is as a resurrectionist. If you found another brand and you dusted it off and you injected all of the beaver magic into it, you knew you could succeed. But it's very different to take your name, your son's name, and put it on a dial and create your own brand and expose your soul to people, right? What were the fears that you had when you were going into this project? My fears are always the same, fortunately because I know them <laughs> and my fear, my biggest fear are my doubts and I say constantly to my doubt, leave me, come on, go away because my doubt is constantly on my shoulder and he controls me, he tells me, hey, are you sure you, have, you want to do that? Just think one more time, so the doubt is my security. If you act without doubt, I won't drive with you. <laughs> you must have doubt. And that makes a good driver, the difference between a good driver and a bad one. The bad one just goes. The good one says, hey, there might be something here. I slow down. So my biggest fear <laughs> is also my biggest assistant because <laughs> it's the doubt. What's your fear today? Um, I have the fear of, let's say, the doubts that I have, just like my father, because obviously hearing him talk about that all the time kind of sinks in. Um, I have the doubts of being wrong because of my lack of experience. I have uh, um, the doubts of being too young and having this motivation to say, no, I know it more, you know, I can change the world, I can do this. Everything that comes with my position, my lack of experience, my lack of age, my lack of, uh, of, of, of everything, let's say, compared to my father, uh, is what makes me doubt, because obviously, you know, I don't, I don't know anything, in, no, in a sense. No, you cannot say that you don't know anything. I mean, like me, you've grown, you were born and raised in the watch industry, so you were basically raised with a lot of codes, a lot of stories, a lot of anecdotes, and finally, to some extent, some experience, and, and, and a big one that nobody else cannot acquire over time because it's part of the fundamentals that you were uh, raised with. So don't you think it's something that makes something positive that working next to your father you can bring him your child's eyes to some extent? Uh, definitely and that's what he encourage, encourages me to do all the time and I think that's why he, he values my opinion. Uh, I'm sure that he, he needs no uh, explanation on many subjects but sometimes on a few different things where he, he finds it hard to reinvent himself or to find new ways of being creative, I think that's where he can really count on me. My doubts and the fact that sometimes I fear of lacking that experience make me listen to him more. He often talks about him listening to others, but the fact that he listens, that he's open, that he's here with his presence and his legendary statue, stature in the watch industry, it makes the people around also want to listen. So there's really this exchange where everything we do, it's the birth of uh, both our, our opinions and not only us, but the whole team. The whole team here reflects this relationship between my father and myself, um, because we have people that have been him, with him for a long time that are very experienced. And we also gave opportunities to younger, less experienced people, because we re really believe that that mix is the soul of, of this project, of this company and of our relationship with, with my father. What do you say to yourself? You, you have succeeded in everything you've done. You're in the, as you've described, the final and most important chapter of your life. You've given yourself another 10 years, so at the age of 74 to 84, to work at the beaver level, which is a superhuman level as we know it. But in those moments of doubt that you have about yourself, what do you say to yourself in the mirror? What do you think about that propels you forwards? I say to myself, I have to listen. I have to learn. If the day I stop listening, the day I stop learning, then I should be afraid of myself. As long as you learn, as, you, as long as you listen, as long as you get information from the others, you can always make the right decision. But if you start to think that you know, then forget it. Never start by thinking you know it. 
You can only know it once you have checked the different opinions and once you have talked with other people, once you have seen other uh, uh, authors, then you can make a decision. You know, you've told me once that one of your greatest teachers was in Fred Pira, right? And you described once how he said he wanted to go to Japan, he wanted to go to Tokyo. Yes. And you said, I want to come with you because I want to see Tokyo through your eyes and you're going to set the agenda and I will discover now this city that I've been through hundreds if not thousands of times <laughs> purely from your eyes. Describe what that experience was like and describe how your son can also be your teacher. The fathers or the mothers, the parents, they should uh, listen more often to their children because the child means tomorrow. And the parents means yesterday. <laughs> the parents have the experience of yesterday. The children have the sensitivity of tomorrow. And if you can have both, you can have on one hand the past, on the other hand the vision of tomorrow, and then you combine them in one, that's the explosion, that's the success. And that is why children are so important and we have, we have to learn to listen to our children rather than the reverse. The only way to have a reverse acceptable is on the ethics. We have, that's what we parents have to bring to our children, the ethics. But the visions, they belong to our kids. Let's talk about the legendary Jean-Claude Bieber watch collection. You, you're one of the greatest Patek Philippe collectors in the world. And what was very interesting to me is that your collection started to evolve when it became a dialogue between you and Pierre. Yes. Tell me how this was uh, and tell me how this dialogue was like to experience what you learned. I think this is, was, was one of the most important moments for me, how to consider Pierre is when he tried to teach me to change my collection, to transform my collection. And I said, why, why do you do that? He said, because I am the member of the future, of the new generation, and the way we will look at watches is not the same way as you are looking. And you have to adapt, and I can help you to adapt. And he told me one of the, uh, the most brilliant examples. I was sitting in a Mercedes convertible from 1911 on a motorway between Saint-Tropez and, and, and Toulon. And the guy said to me, don't you think it's wonderful? I said, it's a great car, it's wonderful. Would you like to buy it? I said, never. He said, why? What, 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 what? I said, because these cars from 1911, I can admire them, I can respect them, but I cannot buy them because they are out of my generation. I want to buy the, the cars of James Bond. I want to buy the cars of the saint. But a car that I was dreaming of, but I was never dreaming about the Rolls Royce of 1911. And here he said, that's what you have to do with your collection. Your collection must not look and not uh, appeal like a car from 1911. It must appeal like a Ferrari from 1967. And that transformation I can do for you. If you give me full power, I will transform your collection. And that's what he did. You know, one of the wonderful things that I saw about the transformation of this collection was the identification of key neoclassical watches and also a shift into independent watchmaking as well. What was it like to discover independent watchmaking together with your son? You will see our collection, my brand. That's my brand. My brand is neoclassic. And it's full of the inspiration of Pierre. It's not that I copy Pierre, it's not that I believe in him like in God, but I understand. And that is the, the very important element. When you listen, you must not only listen with your ears, but you must also understand. 
and I understood what neoclassic means. And this is why the influence and the, and the input of Pierre was so important. And right now he's starting the final chapter of what he calls the final chapter of his life. It's probably the first chapter of yours. Mm -hmm. Um, he's been, people have been listening to him his entire life and you're the one who's challenging him because of course you listen to him, but you challenge him, you contradict him, you cut him when he speaks. Nobody has done this before. What's the dynamic? How were you able when you started that project and you put in his mind that you guys were going to create a, wa a watch brand together? So it, it wasn't so evident always that we were going to do something like that. Obviously I had my reasons to want to do it and the reasons not to. Uh, him the same um, but ultimately I think it's it's destiny life uh, puts the stars together and at some moment you realize it's now or never let's take this opportunity and that's how it was born then you know today we've managed to get a communication that's fairly good uh, but it took some time. I, I won't lie the first few months there was lots of screaming and shouting um, and I think the secret to having a good communication especially in that dynamic is the fact that we learned uh, what both of us are good at and what combats we really want to, to pursue. Um, I'm very interested in the product. I'm really always, I, I love going to our suppliers. I love understanding how the manufacturing process, I love design and everything that's related to the product. And you know, I, I quickly realized, okay, there are some things where I should give up and just listen and really be aware of what he's saying and try to understand. And on some other things, I say, I say no, I, I, I know, look, trust me, this is Deep my instinct, down, I, I want that. and I will pursue this argument uh, to the max. And I think after a few months, we really realized and now we have this super connected communication where we know, okay, I leave you this, I give you that and some other you subjects. Your battles. So, exactly. At what point did you realize as you were evolving the collection together, as you were having this exchange of ideas and this discovery together, that you weren't making a watch collection, you were creating the foundations of a brand? Yes, this is very important. Uh, the brand I made or that I'm, I have done now is for me the conclusion of 50 years of my passion. And that is why, that was one of the great motivation. How can I conclude my 50 years? I must do something. Okay, I can do a feast, I can invite people, but that's, that's too easy. I must do it with my own collection. And my own collection is the inspiration of 50 years of passion, 50 years of doubts, 50 years of happiness, 50 years of friendship, 50 years of admiration, 50 years of dreams. That I want to bring and then I say bye. <laughs> and if we get more into the specific of what the Beaver brand is about, if we dive into the design and mm -hmm. why did you decide to create a tourbillon with a micro rotor, all the, can you get like a little more specifics about it? what makes the brand so different and so in its entirety what do you feel like you wanted to create in the first place? So we wanted to do really do something that's very high-end uh, inspired by all these incredible independent watchmakers that we have the, the chance of knowing today in this industry and that have had more exposure over time. Uh, we wanted to give soul to the watch, we wanted to really have a watch that vibrates, that resonates with the clients, that people can just see it and understand that we try to master every detail. Um, from that idea came the, the, this, this phrase that my father says that is master the invisible, um, which not only means to decorate every component on both sides, but it's to master what people don't necessarily think about or small details or uh, ergonomy or comfort. It, the invisible is, is everywhere and, and, and can be mastered all over the watch, not only specifically on the movement. Um, is it how you got to create the JCB seal? In a way, yes, because we said, so the seal focuses mainly on the movement components and then towards the end we have a few uh, um, requirements for the habillage, the hands, the dials and the cases, um, which have to be at the same standard as the movement, obviously. And um, 
And coming back to the, to the movement, I think the, the central element was that we wanted to start with a military repeater. Uh, that was clear from the, the start because we wanted to start at the top. Uh, my father says, that's his words, that it's easier once you've mastered you know, the highest peak, it's easy to do the smaller ones. Um, and also the military repeater is something special, it's vibration, it's love, it's creation, it's something that's magic, a bit more than a chronograph, although I love chronographs, but it has this extra sensory thing that, that makes it unique. Uh, we decided to add a third hammer. That's just a question of pure taste because we like the, the sonority of a carillon. Um, the tourbillon was to give it some animation because to make, I think, in my opinion, to make a beautiful watch, you need to satisfy many criteria, and one of them is that you need to have some movement. So to bring some life inside the dial. Exactly. On some complications, you have it naturally. On some, like the miniature repeater, not necessarily. So the tourbillon was there for that. And the automatic was to say, we're making a miniature repeater. It's one of the most complicated pieces. It's very fragile. It's not something that people wear uh, so easily. Uh, and often they're manual wound. And we wanted to say, no, we're making a beautiful product, but we want it to be wearable. Because young people today, they want to be able to wear their watches all the time. Um, so obviously we're still, it's still fragile, but we try to improve the, the waterproofness. We try to improve uh, the fact that it's automatic so that it's wearable every day. You don't really need to think about your watch. Uh, we wanted to put in a metal integrated bracelet so that it has this sporty feel and you feel like your watch is solidly on your wrist. And it might be completely contradictory with the idea of a minute repeater, but that's what this mix of tradition and contemporary uh, brings is to say, no, it's not because you, you're some kind of uh, super complicated, fragile movement that you cannot wear it every day. It should be, a collector should be able to wear whatever watch he wants, whenever he wants. I love what you're doing today because it's, it's, it reminds me of something from 1983. And in 1983, you and Jacques Piguet created Blancpain, or resurrected Blancpain, I should say. And this was in an era where no one wanted mechanical watchmaking and no one wanted <laughs> classical yes. watchmaking yes. and no one wanted complicated watchmaking. And you said, no, because I can see where the future is going and we're going to recreate this. And this was one of the key successes of the 1980s, probably the greatest success for uh, mechanical watchmaking. But you've also told me that you always regretted selling Blancpain. And in some ways, what you're doing today, this classical watchmaking, this complicated watchmaking is connected to that past. Tell me about that connection. It's 100% connected. I would have never done it if I would not have had the regrets to have sold Blancpain. That is my revenge. <laughs> That's my way to overcome the sale of my brand. And selling Blancpain was a drama for me. Nobody realized it, but it was a real drama. Uh, and I never, I, I, I could never forget it. Now, slowly, slowly, Thanks to my own brand, I overcome psychologically the sale of Blopa. So it has taken me from 1992, on 7th of July, we sold the brand uh, to Mr. Hayek. And now we are in 2023. It's 40 years to forget that I sold my brand. <laughs> We've seen in recent times that a lot of the dyes are hard stones and you've mm -hmm. made the choice of choosing silver obsidian and sodalite. Mm -hmm. Can you explain why did you choose those two stones? So first of all, for their properties, the, the, what they bring, the, the vibrations they have. My father believes strongly in the power of stones. Uh, I agree too. <laughs> and you know, at their presence since Mesopotamian era, era in each different uh, civilization, there was something in relation to stones. So that was clear from the offset. Then, um, specifically for sodalite and obsidian, we were shown uh, the, the dials, the stones, different types, and it, it came naturally. It was like an instinct. I gravitated towards silver obsidian and my father uh, towards sodalite. And, and what's interesting is when you look at the benefits of each stone, I mean, when you think about silver obsidian, it brings comfort, dynamism, stimulation. It helps to face reality without fear. And it also helps to realize what truly matters. So when you see and read the definition of that stone, it truly is 
I want to say your father's identity. Mm -hmm. The other way around, when you think about Sodalite, it brings courage and confidence and it enhances intuition, encouraging truth and rational thought, which is you being a mathematic um, obsessed, or at least I know that's one of your passion. It truly defines who you are. So it tr it's interesting the balance between how complex and how complicit you and your father are. And also it shows that the, the stones actually have power if we gravitate naturally to, to the opposite. I think one explanation is maybe that each of us is looking f for the other's attributes to complement uh, ourselves. Look at one's back in order to make sure that everybody Exactly. Safe. It's like if uh, I, I wanted the, the, the obsidian because that's what's missing at, at the moment in, in myself. And maybe my father wanted the soul light because that's what's missing for him. And it's the pair that go together that, that makes it magic. What was really interesting is, you know, 32 years ago when you, you sold Blancpain, actually you and Jacques Piguet had always been discussing another chapter. And that chapter was Louis Elise Piguet. Yes. But who was yes. probably the greatest um, movement maker, ebauche maker from the Ballet de Joux, who made some of the most famous Grand Petit Sonnery movements as well. And tell me about how you are working today with Jacques Piguet and how you take inspiration from Louis Elise Piguet in terms of what you want to create for the future. The, the biggest inspiration we, uh, that Louis-Élysée Piguet brought us was when we did the first minute repeater for Blancpain. And we had some problems with the sound. And uh, Frédéric Piguet, the father of Jacques, uh, the grandson of Louis-Élysée, said, you know, uh, I think Louis-Élysée on the last floor of the house we have to check, he has some steel. And we said, oh, to do what? <laughs> to, to do the... The gongs? The gongs. Yes. So he went <laughs> on the last floor, he came back with a piece of steel. And we said, but uh, well, what's that? He said, we, we're going to do some gongs. He said, aha, why? Because this piece of steel has been done thanks to fire, wood fire. Not electric, not uh, other energy. The only energy was uh, fire, wood, wood fire. And if it is done with wood, there must be carbon inside. And the carbon will bring the sound. So <laughs> we started to, to cut the gongs and the miracle happened. Dong! We had the sound of the gongs. That was an incredible lesson because it was not only theory, but we could check it, it was real. Like me, you were born and raised in the watch industry, um, and yet you could have gone completely sideways, but you've decided to grow in the epicenter of it. What made you so passionate? What what interests you so much in the watch industry? Well, I think it's, to be very honest, a hard question to answer because for me, watches is like, it's my life. I've never known a life without the watch industry around me. And uh, when I was a teen, I kind of, kind of rebelled. I wanted to, to go. I wanted to be an architect, actually, uh, for a long time. Then that didn't happen and I wanted to go in finance. And when I finally um, started my professional life because uni wasn't super Your exciting thing. for me. <laughs> I wanted to go to uni, but I wanted to take a break and have a bit of a practical life. And obviously, well, the contacts I know were in the watch industry. My father helped me open many doors and I was super fortunate and privileged to be able to, to do an internship at Philips. And suddenly I, I was in this world and it, the spark just it turned into a, a fire. Uh, I realized that I loved watches. I realized that actually I knew one or two things uh, which was super pleasant you know when you start something and you see that you're not too bad at it <laughs> it, it always makes you happy and then it was really this the idea to discover uh, a, a, a watch industry that was not the one that I grew up with that's what really gave me the passion is to say I grew up with the optics through my father's eyes and what I saw from his life and suddenly a whole new spectrum opened with being at Philips because we got to see vintage pieces other brands uh, independent brands and suddenly the, the, this world that for me seemed always very closed actually opened up and that was what sparked this, uh, this So passion. in other words you're 22 and you've just got your dream job. 
Life uh, is long, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and actually, that's something that's interesting to, to, to think about is my father's at the final chapter and we were having a, a drink the other day with him uh, after work and I was telling him, you know, for me, it's like looking in the uh, ab abyss because now I'm here at 22, but I have this brand and, you know, it has our name and I want my children one day to work here. That's my dream. I want their children to work here. And I was telling him, for me now, in this brand, I have 50 years to look ahead. You have maybe 10 or 15 years and that's a, that's a good time to make many new, you know, because from now on we're starting. So once we do the military Peter, it's new. When we do the, the time only, it's new. When we do the chronograph, it's new. But I was saying, what will I do in 30 years? How will I manage to have new ideas? How will I manage to do this? Well, you have a son. Because you've been listening yeah, to your daughter. father or daughter, but you've, you've been listening to your father your entire life. Now your father has decided to listen to you. And maybe 20 years from now, you'll be listening to your own daughter, your mm -hmm. own son. Maybe the two together. It'll yeah, be hopefully. A mutual force. Yeah. And I think what's great is that uh, uh, the team around, the people that are the closest to me, François, uh, Monsieur Metro, and other people that are here, they're around their 30s, 30s, 40s and I know that we want to build together. So in fact, there's my father, which is, at the, which is the, the head of this project, but then the organs, it's myself and the people around, which will, will stick together. And um, yeah, it's a lifelong experience that we're, I'm, I'm hopping onto. And you know, I just want to, to have this passion my whole life because every morning it's a pleasure to wake up and every night it's a pleasure to go to sleep completely destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> It's very interesting because previous to Blancpain, if you look at how watch companies work, they were établis sales. Yes. Right? All of them, including yes. the holy trinity yes. of watchmaking. All of them, yes. And what they did was they designed a watch, then they would find the best in terms of a uh, watch yes. maker, dial maker, case yes. maker, yes. and yes. they would put it together. So you have gone back to being an établisseur. Yes. So tell me what that's like and who you decided to work with for what. And I think to be again an établisseur gives me an enormous choice. You can choose among a small artist that is doing his dials alone or a big company. You have the choice. And when you have the choice, then you feel free. There is no freedom if there is no choice. <laughs> so in big groups, very often, you have little choice because why would you buy a, a dial from an independent dial maker when your own group uh, owns three dial uh, factories? So going back to become uh, an établisseur gave us wow, the freedom. And it gave us the possibility, or me at least, to discover wonderful people and to discover extraordinary artists that I, in 50 years I never knew them. So the Etablisseur is giving me uh, an, an incredible enrichment. I became richer in knowledge, in people, and I believe today Etablisseur should be more respected and one should not only be proud to be a manufacturer, but <laughs> the proud can only also be if you are an uh, établisseur. The movement of a watch is the heart and soul of the watch. And I know for several years you were searching all over, you know, scouring the entire landscape of movement makers in Switzerland until you found Alain Giselle at Cirque de Gel. Tell me why you chose Alain to be your collaborator. Be because uh, um, I had a recommendation. I had the recommendation of two good old friends to whom I said, I want to do my own brand and I want to be établisseur. Do you have ideas where I should go? And they gave me recommendations. And one of the recommendations was Alain Schisset. From that basic movement, minute repeater, I said, we have to bring something additional, not just buy. Buying is okay but we should also put our stamp in it. And the stamp, we should add a tourbillon, we should add an automatic micro rotor, uh, and we should add carillon. Then we have, we have uh, an evolution 
of the movement and not just a copy of the movement. And that is what we did. And that's what we are going to show now in, uh, in Geneva. I, I've listened to it. I've listened to the Carillon strike of the quarters. Uh, I know Pierre was very involved in the sound quality of these as well. He, he walked me through some videos at the different sounds. And I have to say, it's extraordinary sounding. Uh, I know for you and Pierre also, part of the evolution as watch collectors was to focus on pieces that had the most breathtaking finishing. Tell me about the finishing of your watch and what it's important to you. What is important to me in the finishing is to finish what the customer can never see. <laughs> to master the invisible visibility. What the customer cannot see, but what belongs to the art. The customer cannot see the soul, but it, it doesn't mean that the soul is not in the watch. It's not because you cannot see that the soul is not there. It's not because you cannot see that the finishing is not perfect. So never cheat. If you are at the top, if you want to be at the top of the art, you must respect the art, even in places that nobody will ever see. You must polish as if everybody would see it. And that's my philosophy. Yeah, the, the result is breathtaking. And I know you brought an in-house expertise in finishing as well, yes. so that you could add levels of finishing that are not available as an Etablis sale. Exactly. I, I do think it's quite funny, actually, because um, a, a, the person that was responsible for creating this whole concept of in-house manufacturing actually was you. <laughs> so, yes. So, so, so I, I like that. I, I, I'm back again. You so know, you've gone back I did the, the full circle. The full, the full circle. <laughs> I mean, and if we go full circle, your father's life has been award, uh, towards the word of love. Can you say that yours would be passion or you could describe what would be the best expression of love? I think love, just the same as my father. That's also something that's really bad. Is that you, you, when you spend so much time with your father and you work with him, you start becoming more and more like him. So, it's uh, interesting because you're very like you're a very discreet, almost shy person. You're more of an introvert versus your father is known to scream in front of your, his computer when he does a, a podcast or whenever he's on stage. Like you can feel he's there, mm -hmm. and you're like not the man in the shadow because you have a very strong personality, but you have yet to grown towards the man that he is. But I guess you have 50 years towards you to to become that. Yeah, and I think that actually this aspect of his personality came with his experience because the way I know him, he's not always like that. Uh, he has another personality and I think this really came from his experience and I think that hopefully I can learn to, to become like him because I admire him a lot and uh, I, I respect him so much. And something that's interesting is that your father once said that and I was really amazed when he said it because working with my father, I realized how right he was. He said Jean-Claude is one of the biggest chess players in the industry. He seems like this completely extravagant character that decides something one day and wants it for the next. And sometimes it's true, but in reality, he has everything planned out in his head, all the moves, he's so ahead. And sometimes he tells us, no, don't do this, or I don't want that. Uh, and nobody understands. And six months later, it all fits together. And that's something that's amazing about my father, the fact that he can show a face of being this character and behind have yeah. all this experience to be able to control his where he's going in his direction. Um, and you know what? I think my father told you that because that's what he saw in his own father. Mm. So I think it's some sort of transmission when you have a brilliant person, a brilliant mind, especially in your family, you have to nurture it and you have to learn from those people. Yeah, definitely. Well, you have a long way. Yes, Congratulations for long. everything and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I know you've got to leave pretty soon, yes. um, so I'll ask you one last question. So, you know, fathers and sons or parents and children have different ways of communicating. Like with my mother, for example, she would never say, I love you. She would just say, you look thin, you should eat more, right? <laughs> uh, and, and it strikes me that over the time you spent together amassing your collection, each time you said, Pierre, I'm listening to what you're saying and I, I like what you're saying and we should evolve the collection. or when he said, Dad, we should make a brand and let's do that together. And you said, you're right, now is the time. In fact, what you're saying to him is, I love you, right? Yes. So yes. I'm going back to the original question about love. Would you consider this to be the most sincere expression of your love? The most sincere expression of my love to Pierre is 
my respect, my respect of his knowledge, my respect of his opinions, my respect of his religion, my respect of himself. And that's love. I think the best expression, if, if only one word could replace love, I would say that's respect. Because when you respect, you cannot respect what you don't love. <laughs> it's difficult at least. I don't know how you do that. But for me, respect is love. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So, you know, we've had this incredible day with uh, Jean-Claude and Pierre Beaver. And I think that what we've seen is just resonates with so much emotion, especially the respect that they have for one another. But what are your conclusions, Eleanor? I think it's been a pretty challenging time for both of them. One is starting the final chapter of his life. The other one is starting his first one. And it's an intricate relationship between a father and a son. I mean, when you look at the watch, you have Beaver on the dial and you have JCB on the crown, which brings some sort of detail and storytelling behind the DNA of the brand. Yeah, I love how uh, they've even created their own poinçon, right? The, the JCB poinçon. Uh, what I thought was amazing was the watch was so rich in details that you see, but also the, the ones that you don't see. You know, so for example, this incredible grené finish that, that's done on the base plate is actually done on massive pieces of gold first and then the bridges are cut out because that's the only way you can do it so I, you know I was joking with um, uh, Pierre I was like if you were your own CFO you might have to fire yourself and he said listen I get it but this is the the great opportunity we have is to create beauty without limit and I think that that's wonderful so that's especially between a father and a son they're the only one who can pull it out exactly so I guess in conclusion we loved it have fun Peace.